By mid-November 1943, after R&R &R in Sydney, Australia, the black sheep were back at Turtle Bay and moved into an encampment of Dallas huts recently vacated by another squadron. On their very first night, they had a run-in with the commanding officer of Marine Air Group 11, who chewed out Greg Boyington for having a dirty encampment, even though the previous squadron had left their trash behind only a few hours earlier. His name was Lieutenant Colonel Joe Smoke. The polar opposite of Boyington in almost every regard, Smoke was not a fighter pilot. Tall but pudgy, he was from the dive bomber community, more administrator than warrior, having achieved his rank by strict adherence to rules and regulations. There are no known contemporary photos of Joe Smoke, although his name does appear in several archival documents. He was portrayed by Hollywood under the nom de guerre of Colonel Lard, which Boynton used to avoid liability for slander. Smoke had been one of Greg Boynton's instructors in Pensacola back in 1936 and knew of Boynton's previous reputation in the Marine Corps. He despised Boynton's drinking habits and lack of military bearing, and moreover, was jealous that such a ne'er-do-well as Boynton was not only successful in combat, but received plenty of media attention. Meanwhile, the Black Sheep threw a farewell party for five pilots, including Stan Bailey, Henry Bourgeois, and Bill Case, who had completed their obligatory combat tours and were going home. Major Bailey would one day return to the Black Sheep, but in a totally different environment. Boynton and his remaining pilots now had to integrate with 21 newcomers. A recent directive raised the manning of Marine Corps fighter squadrons from 28 pilots to 40, enough to field 10 four-plane divisions. There was no time to lose, as the squadron would be moving back up the line in a matter of weeks. The new executive officer, Major Pierre Carnegie from Kansas, had completed one tour with VMF-222. Another veteran, one of the original members of 214, was Philadelphia lawyer Henry Miller, recently promoted to major, who had been busy training 13 of the new replacements. They were freshly winged second lieutenants right out of the training command and had arrived at Turtle Bay with zero time in Corsairs. Miller had subsequently built them up to an average of about 30 hours apiece, although Boyington believed that a pilot needed at least 50 hours in the Corsair to feel truly comfortable flying it. Despite the gap in experience, the veterans and replacements blended with little fuss. Conditions at Turtle Bay were comfortable, not unlike the atmosphere of a summer camp and the black sheep devised plenty of ways to entertain themselves. One of the real innovators was Jack Bolt, who was fond of hunting and fishing. He and Bob Bragdon, a native of Pittsburgh, devised a way to trap and kill several wild hogs rooting around in the local dump. This led to a grand barbecue and beer bash. Greg Boynton had started drinking in 1936 as a cadet and was now in his seventh year of progressing alcohol abuse. He drank whenever alcohol was available and by his own admission greatly preferred hard liquor to beer. Despite this, or maybe because of it, he was in his element as a combat leader and the men both adored and greatly respected him. His demeanor was friendly and casual and he didn't pay much attention to rank. His men typically called him Greg, or in more laid-back moments, a few teasingly called him Gramps. After all, he would soon turn 31 years old, was divorced with three kids, and seemed positively old to them. Flying resumed on November 17th with a flurry of training missions in gunnery, formation tactics, and intercepts. But the following day, Boynton was summoned to MAG-11 headquarters, where Colonel Smoke informed him that his command of VMF-214 was being terminated. Boynton returned to the camp and told Frank Walton that Smoke was sending him to Vela Lavella as a staff officer. Walton, seeing right through Smoke's petty jealousy, 
issued Boynton a challenge. You're not going to stand for that, are you? He asked. Boynton jumped in a jeep and drove across the island to visit the Chief of Staff of the 1st Marine Air Wing, Brigadier General James Nuts Moore. A drinking general with a genuine soft spot for Boynton, Moore was a powerful ally. He went ballistic upon learning of the Colonel's meddling and loudly chewed out Smoke over the telephone. In turn, Smoke was livid that Boynton had gone over his head. Citing an obscure general order, he informed Boynton that visiting wing-level staff without authorization was a violation, then applied the maximum allowable penalty and placed Boynton under house arrest for 10 days. When not on duty in the operational area of the field, Boynton would be confined to quarters. The officers' club, in other words, was off limits. Thinking he had clipped Boynton's wings, Smoke was unaware of two important developments. The first was that Boynton had been recommended for a Medal of Honor, and while the paperwork moved up through the chain of command, Lieutenant General Ralph Mitchell, the commanding general of the 1st Marine Air Wing, endorsed a letter of commendation for Boynton, citing his brilliant combat record, readiness to undertake the most hazardous types of missions, and superior flight leadership. The commendation prompted yet another publicity event. A photo shoot was arranged featuring an F4U doctored with stick-on victory flags. The Japanese flags made a bold statement. Boynton was officially recognized as having 20 aerial victories, including six he claimed as a flying tiger. The Corsair was also decorated with the nickname of Boynton's girlfriend, Lucy Malcolmson. Lucy Bell was written in cursive with white chalk, but in the only surviving official photograph, the name was partially obscured. Later, after a very public and humiliating falling out with Lucy Malcolmson, Boynton claimed that the name was Lulu Bell. The truth ultimately came out after personal photographs were discovered in the collections kept by two of Boynton's pilots, who had jumped into the cockpit that day in November 1943 for their own hero shot. The slightly smudged chalk clearly revealed the name to be Lucy Bell. The photo shoot occurred at Turtle Bay, 500 miles from the forward combat area. The markings on the Corsair were temporary, easily removed, and Boynton never flew the plane in combat. On the afternoon of November 26, General Mitchell gave Boynton verbal orders to move his squadron up the line for combat duty at the newly built airstrip on Vela La Vela. With that, Boynton slipped from Colonel Smoke's grasp after serving only six days of his house arrest and General Moore continued to serve up poetic justice by relieving Smoke of his command of MAG-11. The invasion of Bougainville on November 1st had succeeded in securing a narrow beachhead at Cape Torakina, where the legendary Seabees began carving a fighter strip out of the jungle. Its estimated completion was the second week of December at which time single-engine fighters would be able to reach all the way to the big Japanese stronghold at Rabaul. When the airstrip was ready for the final assault to begin, the black sheep would be at the forefront. The wait, however, proved frustrating. After settling in at Barracom airstrip on Bella La Vela with high expectations, the black sheep found themselves in the middle of a lull. It was simply a matter of bad timing. The aerial action over Bougainville had been very heavy during the invasion, where Japanese air groups lost an estimated 70% of the aircraft they had committed. But by the time the black sheep arrived on Bella La Bella in late November, the skies were quiet. For nearly three weeks, the squadron was tasked with flying patrols over Bougainville, with an occasional strafing attack against Japanese facilities.
and suddenly the six-week combat tour was halfway over and not a single enemy plane had been sighted in the air. Boynton's chances of beating the victory record began to look doubtful. On December 8th, a division of black sheep ran low on gas after a patrol and landed at the still unfinished Torquina airstrip to refuel. The new fighter strip was an amazing example of what the Seabees could accomplish. They blasted and bulldozed swampy land to clear space for the field, then spread vast amounts of crushed coral to elevate the strip, which they finished with pierced steel planking, commonly known as Marston Men. Planes began using the airstrip even while the construction crews were still at work, sometimes barely hopping over heavy equipment. Boyington flew up alone to inspect the field on December 10th, the day it was officially declared open. For all its strategic value, the strip at Torakina was narrow. If a pilot let one of his main wheels drift off the Marston mat into the soft bill, a nasty accident was often the result. Second Lieutenant Alan Marker flipped his Corsair on December 12th and was badly injured, missing the rest of the tour before he had a chance to get into combat. And then Mark Groover, the pilot from Georgia who had been wounded during the first combat tour, overturned at Torakina on December 16th. With a side number of 777, his Corsair should have been a lucky one, but it was not. Other accidents were less destructive, but they put planes out of action until repairs could be made. The maintenance crews worked miracles. Their primitive shops were capable of swapping engines, or even replacing entire wings all while working in harsh conditions with basic tools. On December 16th, General Mitchell called in the fighter squadron commanders to announce a big fighter sweep over Rabal, which Boyington would lead early the next morning. Everyone wanted to participate. The mission grew to an unwieldy conglomeration of 80 fighters consisting of Marine Corsairs, U.S. Navy Hellcats, and Royal New Zealand Air Force Kitty Hawks. Boynton led eight of his black sheep up to Torakina at the crack of dawn on the 17th. The field was overcrowded with fighters, but within a couple hours all available planes were refueled and on their way to Rabal. The mission marked a major turning point in the air war in that part of the Pacific. For the first time, single-engine Allied fighters could reach all the way to Rabaul from a jungle airstrip. The Allies, with General MacArthur attacking from New Guinea and Admiral Halsey attacking from the Solomons, were pulling the noose tight around the Japanese fortress. But the enemy that awaited them was formidable indeed. For almost two years, the Japanese had been building Rabaul into the most dominant stronghold in the Southwest Pacific. It was the headquarters of the Imperial Japanese Navy's 11th Air Fleet, which could launch as many as 100 fighters from a handful of airfields. Although the overall quality of Zero pilots had diminished since their heavy losses at Midway and Guadalcanal, the Japanese were still highly capable. The mission led by Boynton turned out to be more like a round of sparring than a slugfest. The Japanese scrambled a total of 70 fighters, and there were a few losses on both sides, but few Zero pilots got up to the Corsair's higher altitude, 
and Greg Boynton struck out. He got his next opportunity on December 23rd, although he was not in tactical command of the raid. The plan was complex, first calling for 24 heavy bombers escorted by 48 Navy and Marine fighters to attack shipping at Rabaul. They would be followed by a fighter sweep consisting of 48 Corsairs and P-38 Lightnings, led by Major Marion Carl, the Marine Corps' first ace. The bombing run by the B-24s was reportedly good, but nearly 100 Zeros had scrambled from Rabaul this time, and many hit the fighters protecting the rear of the bomber formation. One Hellcat pilot and two of the Black Sheep, including the executive officer, Major Carnegie, were shot down by the swarming Zeros. The fighter sweep element led by Marion Carl was more successful, especially for Boynton. He was credited with four victories, shooting down all four in the span of a few minutes, which raised his overall record to 24. Other members of the squadron combined for seven more victories, including a Zeke for Major Henry Miller, his only victory of the war. But success came with a price. Another black sheep pilot, First Lieutenant Bruce Folks, failed to return. With three pilots missing in action and presumed dead, it was the worst day yet in the combat history of VMF 214. None of the three missing pilots were ever found. Back at Vela La Vela, the buzz was all about Greg Boynton. Now just two victories shy of the existing record, he suddenly found himself in the glare of the media spotlight. Despite the sobering loss of three pilots, the effect of his victories was euphoric. Boynton even told a correspondent that he was the happiest man in the world. But eventually the thrill wore off. Everywhere he went on Vela La Vela, Correspondents crowded around him to ask about the ace race. Boynton was off the schedule for December 24th, and a big Christmas Eve party got started in his tent. During the revelry, Bob Bragdon told Boynton that the black sheep were worried about his safety, especially regarding the pressures associated with the record. Boynton vowed that the Japanese couldn't kill him. Hell, he boasted, I'll meet you in a San Diego bar and we'll all have a drink for old time's sake. Still feeling the effects of a hangover, Boynton was back in the cockpit on December 27th to lead a fighter sweep of 64 Corsairs and Hellcats to Rabaul. The Japanese responded by scrambling 50 interceptors, resulting in a wild melee. Don Fisher downed two Zeeks to reach ace status, and other black sheep accounted for two more, while Boyington uncharacteristically scored just a single victory. When the squadron returned to Vela La Vela that afternoon, Boyington shut down his rumbling engine and tiredly held up one finger. He had narrowed the gap but the record still eluded him. Later that afternoon, the Marine Corps capitalized on a different opportunity to publicize Boynton and the Black Sheep. Two months earlier, in a newspaper article published on the eve of the 1943 World Series, the squadron had pledged to trade their victories for ball caps from the winning team. The New York Yankees won the series, but it was the St. Louis Cardinals who answered the call. 
A parcel containing a stack of ball caps and several Louisville sluggers arrived at Bella La Bella on December 27th, and the black sheep are all smiles as they pose with their new caps and bats on the stout wings of a Corsair. Note the number, the last three digits of the airplane serial number, painted on the landing gear doors. The squadron now boasted six aces, including Chris McGee, Bob McClurg, Moon Mullen, Greg Boynton, Jack Bolt, and Don Fisher. The smiles did not last long. The following day, the CO of another Marine squadron led the next fighter sweep over Rabal. Interestingly, here's the same Corsair used for the publicity shoot on Bella La Bella, now at Torakina Fighter Strip prior to a mission. The event on December 27th consisted of 46 Corsairs, including Boyington and three divisions of Black Sheep. But the formation was outnumbered by 72 Japanese interceptors. The enemy gained a significant altitude advantage, and a large force of Zeros overwhelmed the four-plane division led by Captain J.C. Dustin at the rear of the formation. Dustin and his wingman, new replacement Harry Bartle, were both shot down. The worst blow for VMF-214 was the loss of Don D.J. Moore from Texas, one of the most popular members of the squadron who was positioned at the tail end of Boynton's division. Against the loss of three black sheep, Boynton himself came up empty, claiming only one probable victory. Despite the squadron's painful losses, newspapers eagerly reported Boynton's rapid rise in the ace race, much like it was a dramatic pennant race in professional baseball. It was at about this time that war correspondents heard the squadron's campfire song adapted from the Yale Whiff and Poof song, which referred to Boynton as Pappy to fit the lyrics. In reality, the pilots called him Greg, sometimes Gramps, but never Pappy. His next opportunity to tie or beat the victory record was scrubbed because of bad weather. So on New Year's Eve, he broke the lock off the flight surgeon's stash of medicinal brandy, mixed up a big jug of limeade, and soon had another party going. Boynton returned for his fifth fighter sweep over Ribal on the morning of January 2, 1944, but his string of bad luck continued. A serious oil leak developed in his Corsair just a few miles from Ribal, and he flew back to Vela La Vela in disgust. With only a few days left in the combat tour, his chances of achieving fame and glory were slipping away. Boynton begged his superiors for one more opportunity, and was approved to lead a fighter sweep on January 3rd, but with only eight of his own pilots. He did an unusual thing. Instead of taking his regular division, Boynton selected three pilots who had done relatively little shooting. Captain George Ashman from New Jersey, one of the most likable division leaders, hadn't so much as damaged an enemy plane in nearly two tours of combat. He would fly on Boynton's wing. Jim Hill and Al Johnson, two others who had seen little combat action, brought up the second section. The sweep, consisting of 28 Corsairs and 16 Hellcats, began early on the morning of the 3rd. Several planes dropped out because of mechanical issues, including three of the Black Sheep. Bruce Matheson and Rufus Mack Chatham slid in behind Boyington and Ashman to form a single division. Boyington led the formation over a ball in a sweeping turn, then spotted a gaggle of zeros and dived to attack. With Ashman close behind, he closed the gap on the last enemy fighter in line and flamed it in full view of several American pilots. 
the record at last had been tied. Boynton and Ashman continued to descend and seemingly disappeared as if swallowed by the murky haze. In due time, the other black sheep returned to Vela La Bella, where they found the usual crowd of reporters and photographers waiting in Boynton's revetment. By midday, however, Boynton and Ashman had not returned. Gradually, it became evident that they had to be down somewhere. Ground crews, squadron members, and media personnel milled around in disbelief, hoping the overdue Corsairs would appear. They never did. Henry Miller became the interim commanding officer and organized several extensive searches, but the black sheep turned up nothing. The squadron's last mission occurred on January 6th. A fighter sweep of more than 70 planes headed for Rabaul, but bad weather interfered and most of them turned back. Two divisions of black sheep remained in the area, determined to continue searching for Boynton and Ashman. Among them, Harry Johnson was the only pilot to spot enemy planes, a cluster of zeros east of Rabaul. Latching onto a straggler, he watched it fly right into his stream of bullets and catch fire. Johnson, a replacement from Alabama, had no idea that the tumbling zero would be the last victory officially credited to VMF-214, all the way up to the present day. The Black Sheep received word that their combat tour was over. By January 8th, they were back at Turtle Bay, where they learned that the ground echelon of VMF-214 had already departed by ship for the United States, and the unit number had gone with it. For the next few weeks, the squadron was officially listed as inactive, but a whole new unit would soon be reconstituted in California. The new squadron, led by Stan Bailey, would inherit a phenomenal legacy. During the two tours led by Greg Boynton, totaling just 84 days of combat, the Black Sheep had officially destroyed 97 enemy aircraft and probably destroyed 35. Another 50 enemy planes had been damaged and nearly 30 barges and small vessels sunk. Perhaps the most amazing statistic was that out of the initial roster of 28 pilots, nine had become aces. But the men of Boynton's squadron were devastated. Their casualties had been heavy, and their beloved skipper was missing in action, presumed dead. But they didn't know that Boynton was a prisoner of war, and the pledge he had made on Christmas Eve about meeting them at a bar after the war would prove amazingly prophetic. In the meantime, the new black sheep would fly improved Corsairs when they eventually returned to combat, but this time they would be fighting a different kind of war from the deck of an aircraft carrier, deep in Japan's home waters. In the pendulum of fate, as they would learn, swung both ways. Thank you for watching. 